Welcome, happy Easter. It is April 4th, 2021, and we celebrate the gift of the resurrection. This Easter Sunday, we come together to give thanks to God for the gift of God's love, God's peace. If you're available at 9 a.m. here on Easter Sunday, we're gonna be having a special Zoom worship service. We'll be celebrating communion together. Have your own elements ready so that we can partake in the cup and in the bread together. And that'll be followed by, at ten, that'll be at nine o'clock. At 10 o'clock, we'll have a fellowship time and also some time for uh, young people to get together for education and our talk back time will take place. We are glad that you're able to join with us. We are First Presbyterian Church of Fond du Lac. We are Christians serving, learning, and loving. We also will be continuing uh, back to our previous Wednesday devotional times. It'll be a smaller, simpler service, but that'll be available as a podcast that you can reach on the website. It's also in a email that I send out on Wednesdays. If you'd like to be part of our email list, receive emails on Wednesdays and Saturdays, let me know. You can reach me at Rev. J. Harrison at fdlpresbyterian.org. Also, I invite you to check out our website and especially look at our newsletter. You can find us at www.fdlpresbyterian.org. It is Easter Sunday. It's a special time to worship and give praise to God. So offer a short prayer of praise to God and thanks for the gift of being able to come together and give thanks to God for all of the good things of our families and of the places where we live. Let's welcome the light of Christ into our midst as we come together to worship. Glory to you, O God. On this day, you won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ, for us and for our salvation, you overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. And glory to you, O Holy Spirit, you lead us into the truth. Glory to you, O Blessed Trinity, now and forever.
Christ, after your resurrection, you appeared to your disciples. You breathed on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. You gave joy and exaltation to the whole creation. Through your victory, we pray to you, hear us, Lord of glory. O Christ, after your resurrection, you sent out your disciples to teach all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You promised to be with them and with us until the end of the world. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. O Christ, through your resurrection, you lifted us up and filled us with rejoicing. Through your salvation, you enrich us with your gifts. Renew our lives and fill our hearts with joy. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. O Christ, you are glorified by angels in heaven and worshipped on earth. On the glorious feast of your resurrection, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. Save us, O Christ our Lord, in your goodness. Extend your mercy to your people who await the resurrection and have mercy on us. Hear us, Lord of glory. O merciful God, you raised your beloved Son, and in your love you established him as head of your church and ruler of the universe. By your goodness we pray. Hear us, Lord of glory. O God, you gave your only Son to suffer on the cross for our redemption, and by his glorious resurrection you delivered us from the power of death. Grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now please join together in the prayer of confession. <clears throat> Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Humbly, we open our hearts to your love and grace. Amen. Please take a few moments for your own personal confession. Do not be afraid. Christ is risen. The power of sin and death has been broken. Through the gift of Jesus' love and grace, we all have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The first scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. 
for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Our gospel lesson comes from the gospel according to John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. This is our familiar Easter gospel reading. It comes following the betrayal, the beating, and finally the death of Jesus on the cross. And now we are three days later in the resurrection. This reading, unlike Matthew and Luke, focuses on Mary Magdalene and on the experience of coming to encounter the risen Christ in that powerful moment. In this passage, we have for us the revelation that death does not have the final word, that God's will is greater than all of the things that we fear, and that the resurrection is the promise of God's gift to all of those who love and trust in him. So from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, we read, Early on the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their own homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at his head and the other at his feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Herbone, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I I am ascending to my Father, and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May the Lord bless us and teach us through the gift of this word. Please pray with me. 
Jesus, our risen Savior, we celebrate this gift, the gift of your resurrection. We rejoice because we know that death does not have the final word. We do not live in fear. We're not governed by uncertainty. We live in the triumph of the resurrection, the victory of eternal life over death. We live now in this place of constant hope and blessing. Help us to hear your voice, to know the love that you share with us and to abide in the continued blessings of your presence. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. I was reflecting back on a year ago when we were just into the pandemic and Easter came even though we had thought we'd be closed for a couple of weeks, but we'll be back together for Easter. How little we knew at that time of really what this was going to involve, of especially all of the conflict, all of the loss, all of the division and the ways in which so many would struggle. We could never imagine that over 500,000 people would be dead after a year, that we would still have so many who are disconnected from each other over fights, over how we should be living and what we should be doing and what is right and proper. We had no imagination of how strong this virus would be in the influence and the power that it would have over us, over our lives, over one another. And we didn't realize what type of divisions it would create. There's a tendency to identify the visions by ideology or by political group or by other things, but I have come to the point of view that these divisions are based more upon whether or not we will rely on grace or whether we continue to hold fast to power. Power is popular. Power is the ideal that if we are forceful enough, others will comply to our will, that we can make things change in the way we think they should be changing, and if we're in control, then everything will be fine. Power is simple. Power just looks at opposition and says, you're bad, we're good, you go away or do what we tell you. And then it tries to move on from there. The only problem is that power hasn't settled anything. Grace is more complicated. It is profound and powerful, but it takes persistence, it takes work, and it is slow to get all people to let go of their dependence upon power, on their convinced point of view, and upon their belief that with a little more might, they can force their will. Grace means that we believe that God is doing something in our midst, even if we're not entirely sure what it is. Grace says, all of us are subject to making mistakes, to not having the entire picture, but we are all together in God's will. Grace says God is the one who is greater than either the issues that we face, the troubles that we are struggling with, or our own will or need to dominate. And it's in that way that grace brings hope it is a powerful gift in bringing us an expectation that God will over out win. God will, after all things come together, be the one that brings peace. God is the one who will show us the way. And that's the thing about Easter. Easter is the true sign that in spite of the domination of force over Jesus's body, in spite of injustice, betrayal, beating, and hostility, in spite of crowds, and in spite of everything that went to put him in that tomb, death does not have the final word. Grace has the final word, and that final word is life. It's resurrection. It's fellowship and peace. 
That's why we celebrate this day. Because Easter is our affirmation and our recognition that in spite of what we have seen over this past year, in spite of the divisions that have been forced upon us as a people, in spite of the trials and the suffering and the distance, life has the final word through the resurrection. Christ has the final word, and that word is victory. And we are going to see the victory of eternal life over all that has been suffered and all that has been struggled. Easter is not about something that happened 2,000 years ago in that way. Easter is about what we experience today. There is that event of the experience of discovering that empty tomb. But the reason why this becomes so powerful and so meaningful is because there is an experience to be had now, today, amongst us. It's something that we share even if we're not in the same room. It's the experience of the promise of Christ that binds us together and reminds us that through Christ, we can overcome all of the obstacles and all of the challenges that are out there. The power of Easter is shared by Mary Magdalene when she goes to the disciples and she says, I have seen the Lord in the present tense, in the first person. I have seen God's gift of life. And that gift continues to not only abide with us, but be the promise that we're going to share with each other. We share the gift of resurrection today, the gift of the empty tomb, the gift of Christ's victory. The resurrection is happening right now. Now, I don't mean that as you look around, you see people popping out of tombs. What I mean is that we are experiencing the resurrection through faith, but we are also providing that experience to each other. And it's an interaction in relationship with God. The resurrection is not past tense, it's present tense. It's not something that happened in another place. It happens with us now. We have seen the Lord. We have seen signs that Christ is with us. We see it both through the testimony that others will share with us, and we see it through our own experiences of victory, even the victories that we see over this past year, over a pandemic that robbed us of so much. We see the victory of Christ in the relationships that have grown stronger. We see the victory of the resurrection in the way people have been faithful to each other, caring for each other, and shown that care in preventing the spread of infection, in lovingly praying for each other in those times that there's been loss, and finding creative ways to reach out to each other so that that support can continue to be there. We've seen the resurrection in the way neighbors have lifted each other up and cared for each other's needs, the way in which people have been encouraged even when they've been afraid. The resurrection is present, it's now, it's in first person. And that's the thing which is what we come together to share at this time. There are so many forces that would separate us or threaten us, but we know that Christ has the final word. And that word is that God's grace and love is greater than any power that anybody might seek to use to try and force their will upon all of these things. We are in the midst of the resurrection and we want to lift it and celebrate it with each other. The story of the resurrection is not a erasing of the past. A matter of fact, it's very important in the resurrection that we recognize the sorrow, we recognize the defeat so that we can fully appreciate the victory of God. When Mary Magdalene was coming to the tomb, she expected a continuation of the loss and devastation that had culminated on that Friday with the death of Jesus. She had seen one who she had trusted as her Lord and who had been so important to her, breathe his last breath and his death took place. 
there are other things that we don't fully understand and appreciate about how difficult that was. Mary Magdalene had no real connection with Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were the two who took the body of Jesus off the cross. They were Pharisees. They were people that many would have considered enemy, and they were at least suspicious of what motivations these men might have had. They had not really any knowledge that Nicodemus had come to Jesus by night to learn of what Jesus would teach him. They had no understanding that these were two people who had faith and love in Christ. And so they only know that Jesus's body had been taken down from the cross and placed in a strange grave by people with whom they had no connection. Mary was worried what they might have done, what plans they might have had, what purpose might have been behind their, head, their choice to remove the body and put it in that tomb. So she approached the tomb with dread and with fear, what she might find. She had no idea that they had actually worked to prepare the body before she had come. And so when she came, she had this desire to see what had happened, but also this dread of what might be there. She had this expectation of continued loss and disaster. She came with hopelessness and was disturbed to discover that the stone had been removed from the tomb, that the tomb was no longer sealed safely. She had worried about how they would get inside and now worse yet, somebody already had. And worse yet, the tomb is empty. It was at that time that she did not expect a miracle. She expected more loss. And that expectation drove her into this mode of trying to find some solution, to find some power to be able to end this loss of control, this uncertainty. And so she went and reached out to the disciples. It speaks of Peter, and then John refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved, ran to the grave to see what they could find. But what they located there was not an answer, it was a puzzle. It was a question. Where they had expected to find that image of loss, there was a vacant space. More than that, there was a confusing space. The grave cloths had been removed from the body. Grave robbers are not known for their wanting to take extra steps, especially not folding things neatly. And the body would not be worth anything. Worse than that, the body would be considered unclean, while the grave cloths would have some value. It's a little like breaking into an art museum and stealing the frames while leaving the canvases behind. It made no sense. It was confusing. Peter saw this with fear and confusion. John had the beginning of the awakenings of faith, but he did not understand it. He did not know what this meant. And it was in this same way that Mary continues to persistently seek to know some answer. She looks inside and sees two angels, two messengers from God who are there and they ask her, why are you weeping? It's as if they are saying, the tomb is empty. This is the message. The gift of God has acted. But Mary continues to say this same statement over and over again. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Even when she turns around and speaks to Jesus, she doesn't see him. There's a lot of question and conjecture why Mary did not recognize Jesus. Was his image altered in some ways? Did he appear differently? Or was it that through her tears, 
she could not see clearly? Or was it that she was so full of grief and so convinced of continued devastation and loss that she could not see what was in front of her, that Christ was risen? Jesus was persistent and loving. He reached out to her tenderly and he said, Mary. It was hearing her name spoken with that familiar voice that she replied back familiarly, Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher. And suddenly in that instant, in that moment of those two voices, this restoration takes place. The Easter moment is when all of a sudden Mary goes from being oriented around death and expectation of loss, continued domination of grief and sorrow and suffering to a restoration of a relationship she thought was gone forever. In that moment, that transformation that God has the last word, that resurrection victory overcomes everything that came before it, it did not make it null. It did not make it go away. It transformed it. And we see now that death does not have the final word. That this is the gift and this is the promise. And see, the thing is, outside of that resurrection perception and experience, outside of that resurrection knowledge, it sounds naive. It seems like wishful thinking. It sounds like something that's impossible. We know the resurrection because we share the resurrection and that's what changes our perspective and our point of view. That gives us the ability to know that God acts and to see God act in our midst. We need to be able to experience the resurrection and share the resurrection. It needs to be present tense in our own life and it needs to be passed from person to person with love, compassion, and appreciation. And that is so very important. It's interesting that in the passage from 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is speaking about the differences and the divisions that happen and the way in which the resurrection is passed down. In chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, each of you says, I belong to Paul or Apollos or I belong to Cephas or I belong to Christ as he's talking about the way in which identity has been split up by the desire for power over the church and dominion over the circumstances that the church in Corinth is facing. But what is so significant is that these same names are the people who Paul identifies as being the chain of the resurrection, the means by which the message is kept first person and alive when the apostle Paul says for I handed to you as a first importance what I in turn received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas then to the 12 then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time most of them are still alive though some have died and then he appeared to James and then all of the apostles. And last of all, as to one some, to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me. Those same relationships that had been taken as their identity of separation, the way in which they divided themselves, were actually the relationships which were brought together by the resurrection, the means by which the present tense message of I have seen the Lord came to us and to be shared. What I find interesting, it, it talks about Peter, Cephas, as being a key part of this message. It's both the one whom some factions in the church in Corinth use as their identity to separate themselves, but it's also a key part of bringing them together. You know, Peter and Paul didn't get along. They fought quite a bit. And it's interesting that Paul also names James 
He didn't get along with James during this time when he's writing this letter either. They had these differences of opinion over purity versus the expectation of unity. They struggled with how they would be able to be the body of Christ and what they believed separately and together. And so in the middle of all of this, Paul recognizes that they are a chain, that they have been brought together and they have been made one so that this resurrection message is still current. It's still powerful. It is still, I have seen the Lord, even though sometimes it's among people who don't see eye to eye. In some places, it's in ways that they don't agree. It's in so many places in which they struggle with each other. The resurrection is current. It is present. It is today. We have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord through the pandemic bring peace to the hearts of people who are troubled. We have seen the resurrection in the lives of people we've lost who have run a faithful race and we haven't been able to grieve them as we should. We have seen the Lord in each other, in those who have overcome illness, in those who have struggled against division and fear, in those who have been troubled by issues with their families, in those who have had to overcome financial worries and woes. We have seen the Lord. We see the Lord. And we are continuing to be people who live by the resurrection. So on this day, on this Easter, we celebrate and we say, I have seen the Lord. And we rejoice and celebrate and we praise God. We are the people who continue to live the resurrection life. This is the day the Lord has made and the victory of God has been won. So celebrate that. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And this is the gift of resurrection life. Please join me in prayer. Jesus, our risen Savior, we celebrate the gift of resurrection. Through your love and forgiveness, death no longer has dominion over us. And we are set free to live as your beloved people. We are in fellowship with you, and that gives us fellowship with one another. And we give thanks and praise for what you have done that we could not have done for ourselves. We pray that this message of hope and joy can be shared with all of the world. There's been so much suffering, but God has overcome and shown us the power of grace. There's been so much loss, but the Holy Spirit transforms our sorrows in celebration and joy. And there has been much difficulty. But instead of a tale of woe, we have stories of God's triumph. This is the day that God has promised, the day of celebration and victory. We ask that your love and your grace will come into all lives and particularly those who continue to struggle with their sorrow and their fears. Let your peace be known to everyone as we join in the words that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and in life everlasting. Amen. Happy Easter. We are First Presbyterian Church of Fond du Lac. We are Christians serving, learning, and loving. And I'm so glad we could come together to celebrate this gift of Christ's resurrection. Check us out on the web. You can find us at www.fdlpresbyterian.org. And if you'd like to say anything, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at Rev. J. Harrison at fdlpresbyterian.org. God's blessings be with you and your family. Stay safe. We look forward to when we can be together again. God be with you till we meet again On seaways protracting hiding Dim and I still provide you God be with you till we meet again God be with you till we meet again